When I drive on long trips, I love to use cruise control. Cruise control is a lot like the way our nervous system works. Um, we have receptors in the car that determine how fast we are driving. That would be the speedometer. And if we're driving too fast or too slow, the computer registers this and then sends out a response to the engine to either accelerate or sends the response out to the brakes to slow down. Okay, our nervous system does the same thing. We've got sensory input, which gathers sensors from all over our body. Think about our temperature sensors and our pressure sensors in our fingertips to feel pressures. And think about our pressure sensors in our carotid artery that are able to detect our blood pressure, for example. These are our sensors that are gathering information throughout our body. That information is being sent along via neurons. These are nerve cells. Okay, so our nervous system has neurons. And it goes to the central nervous system, which is our brain and our spinal cord. We know that our brain integrates all this data and makes decisions. The spinal cord actually is involved with that too because it has some reflexes, which are like small decisions. Then there's motor output. So a neuron or a nerve cell carries information back out to the body to tell it what to do. For example, it could send um, an action potential, a nervous impulse, out to a muscle or to a gland to activate them. It shows that idea. We have sensory input, like what we see with our eyes. This information is sent to our brain and our spinal cord where integration happens or decision making. And then in red, we see the motor output to make a muscle move. This important slide, which has a bit of an overview of the nervous system. We're going to start in the blue sections on the left. We have sensing organs. They sense what's going on in the body, just like we've talked about. They send impulses along afferent nerve pathways through what we call the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system has cranial and spinal nerves. There are 12 cranial nerves and 31 spinal nerves. They're both paired, by the way. So 12 paired cranial nerves, 31 paired spinal nerves. This goes to the brain and spinal cord, which is the CNS, the central nervous system, where decisions are made, integration is happening. Then information goes back out through our per peripheral nervous system again, through the side called efferent or motor neurons. Um, these types of pathways, there are two of them. Somatic, voluntary, which we have an opportunity to think about and make decisions about, or the autonomic pathway, which is a good name because it's all automated and it's involuntary. We have no control over it. It goes out to the cardiac and um, muscle and smooth muscles and glands. And then that group is subdivided into parasympathetic and sympathetic. Okay, parasympathetic is all about relaxa relaxation and sympathetic is called fight or flight. It's all about being pumped up so that you can run, for example, from a predator. Parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation or um, impulses are usually somewhat in balance in our body, so a bit like a teeter-totter, we'll have a little bit of sympathetic effect and a little bit of parasympathetic at all times, um, or at most times, pardon me. But if you're relaxing on the couch, watching Netflix, and you're feeling very, very relaxed, you have more sympathetic effect at that time. If you almost go through a red light at an intersection and almost get hit and your heart is racing and you're nervous and sweaty, you have more sympathetic activity happening at that time. So maybe you can understand that there's a balance between these two systems usually. So parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, divisions make up the autonomic nervous system, pardon me. And then the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system together make up the efferent side of our pathway. We've talked about the CNS, which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord, and that it receives sensory information, it integrates it, and makes decisions, and sends out outgoing instructions. The nerves that go to and from the brain are part of the peripheral nervous system, and they're either spinal or cranial nerves. The spinal nerves, there are 31 paired nerves that carry impulses to and from the spinal cord, and then 12 paired cranial nerves carry impulses directly to and from the brain. They, they bypass the spinal cord. And of course this allows good communication. So these afferent nerve fibers carry information from the body to the CNS. The somatic 
afferent fibers carry information from the skin and joints, etc. The visceral afferent fibers um, carry information from the visceral organs, from the organs in our abdomen, for example. And then we have the motor or efferent division. This is where uh, nerve fibers carry information out to the body, to the muscles and glands. We have two subtypes of that. The somatic voluntary nervous system, which we can have conscious control over, like our skeletal muscles, for example. And then we have this autonomic or automatic system. It's involuntary. It controls our cardiac um, muscle, for example, our heart and the tone around our blood vessels and our gut, for example. Now, this system is further divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic, like I talked about earlier. The classic nerve cell is the neuron that we are gonna look at a lot. But, the, so the neuron is the nerve cell that carries uh, nerve impulses, and it's sort of the backbone of the whole system, I guess. But the neuron needs some supporting cells. We call them neuroglial cells or glial cells. Um, they basically support the neuron and um, protect it and insulate it and they, these supporting cells are not able to actually carry nerve impulses themselves. They just help the neuron. It would kind of like be a superstar um, and all the supporting people that support them. So let's say Beyonce is the superstar or the neuron does like the big star work but she would have all these supporting people around her. They would be the neural glia. They support her. Let's talk for a second about your brain and your spinal cord. Well, we know that they're absolutely precious tissue uh, and we need them to be very functional in order to stay alive. So we had to have protective mechanisms in place to protect our brain. And we wanna make sure that if we ingest a toxin, it's not gonna to get to the brain and harm the brain. So what the brain has done is it's formed something called the blood-brain barrier, which is exactly what it sounds like, a barrier between the blood and the brain. Part of that barrier is made up by glial cells or neuroglial cells called astrocytes. So let's take a look at astrocytes. Astrocytes are star-shaped and they anchor themselves on the blood capillaries that are in the central nervous system. They make up a portion of the blood-brain barrier and it controls the permeability of the capillaries in the central nervous system. That is how it controls whether a toxin can get into the brain or not. It protects the neurons in the CNS from harmful substances in the blood. It also controls the chemical environment of the brain. I just want to mention here too, the blood-brain barrier allows good things through and does not allow bad things through an awesome picture of an astrocyte. We see it star-shaped. It has projections that wrap themselves around capillaries and make those capillaries very tight so they're not very leaky because remember astrocytes want to prevent bad things from entering the brain. Another neuroglial cell is called a microglial cell. Um, this is in the central nervous system it's sort of spider-like looking. It monitors the health of neurons and acts as a phagocytic action. That means it can engulf uh, dangerous things that are in the area. It disposes of debris as well. Another type of CNS glial cell are ependymal cells. They line um, cavities called ventricles in the brain and they have cilia on them. These cilia are able to move the cerebral spinal fluid around and create movement of CFSF. The cerebral spinal fluid is always moving in the brain and spinal cord. Another glial cell in the central nervous system would be oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes have projections which wrap themselves around neurons. Um, and just as it says, they wrap around a nerve fiber in the central nervous system. They create something called a myelin sheath. And we're going to be studying the myelin sheath more, but it's an important um, supporting role that the oligodendrocytes have to support the neuron. In the peripheral nervous system, there are two types of supporting cells, Schwann cells and satellite cells. The Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system form that myelin sheath I was just referring to. Um, very similar uh, design, but they're just 
different cells out in the peripheral nervous system. Also, in the peripheral nervous system, we have satellite cells, and they act to protect and cushion neuron cell bodies. Here they are, the glial cells of the peripheral nervous system. In purple, we see the satellite cells. They look like a baby bonnet around the cell body of a neuron. They are there to support and protect the cell body of the neuron. And then in blue, we see the Schwann cells. They are wrapped like pancakes wrapped around um, a pencil and they form a myelin sheath and that will help the neuron. So neuron is the star of the nervous system basically. It's uh, the big player because it carries impulses. Neurons are also known as nerve cells. We know they transmit nerve impulses. They have a cell body which has a nucleus. It's considered the metabolic center of the cell and it has processes or fibers that extend from the body. Some of those processes include dendrites and axons. So dendrites stick out from the cell body and they receive impulses. So impulses come through the dendrites to the cell body and then an axon uh, carries impulses away from the cell body down the axon. At the end of the axon there are vesicles that contain neurotransmitter like acetylcholine for example and that can be released at a synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is a little tiny gap between the end of the neuron, which is called an axon terminal, and the next neuron, or at sarcolemma, if it's butting up against a muscle cell. The synapse is the junction between nerves where a nerve impulse is transmitted. This is an excellent image of a neuron. What we see is that there's a cell body with a nucleus in it, and this is where um, all the me metabolism basically happens. And we have dendrites that collect information and bring it to the cell body. And then we have an axon going down to an axon terminal, which is where neurotransmitter would be released. Notice the blue bulbs on the way. Those, of course, are the myelin sheath they are formed by Schwann cells wrapping around, like a pancake wrapping around a pencil, like I said. In between the Schwann cells, uh, the bulged out Schwann cells, we have nodes of Ranvier. They're the little gaps in between the Schwann cells. The myelin sheath is uh, a white fatty type of substance and it protects the neuron. Very importantly, it speeds up nerve transmission, nerve impulse transmission. This is very important because some disorders cause damage to the myelin sheath and maybe now you can understand that that would cause the impulse to not be able to transfer as quickly along the axon because if the role of the myelin sheath is to speed up conduction and we lose some of that myelin sheath then our conduction is going to be very poor. Uh, the nodes of Ranvier, like we mentioned, are the gaps along the myelin sheath and in the peripheral nervous system, it's Schwann cells that make the myelin sheath. And in the central nervous system, it's oligodendrocytes that produce the myelin sheath, which is a slightly different design. Let's look at how a Schwann cell wraps around the axon of a neuron. This image kind of shows that. It, it wraps around like a jelly roll. And remember, one of its main functions is to speed the conduction of the nerve impulse along the axon. In blue, we see a neuron picking up information from the environment of our body. It's carried along an afferent neuron going up to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, there is an interneuron which allows communication uh, between the afferent neuron and the efferent neuron. Then the efferent neuron cell body is seen in red and there is an axon traveling along. It's on an efferent neuron um, going out to a muscle or a gland and that's shown in red. It's good to know that there are a few different types of neurons. They're called multipolar, bipolar, or unipolar. The typical type of neuron that we draw and study is the multipolar neuron. Neurons need to be able to be irritable or stimulated, and they also need to be able to conduct an impulse along their axon. 
Just think about some of the longest neurons in our body extend from our spinal cord down to our large toe. So we know that that's about three feet in some people. Um, we need to be able to carry an impulse along the axon of the neuron all the way down to the great toe. Okay, we're going to get into how a nerve impulse is carried along a neuron. <clears throat> Let's start off by talking about what a rest on, or resting pardon me, neuron membrane looks like. The plasma mem membrane is at rest. It's inactive and it's called polarized. The reason it's called polarized is because if we could look at the inside of the cell membrane, it would be a little bit negative, okay? So when we're at rest, there's a little bit of negativity on the inside of that cell membrane. Uh, fewer positive ions are inside the neuron's cell membrane than outside, making it more negative. Potassium is the major cation on the inside of the cell, and sodium is the major cation on the outside of the cell. As long as the inside of the membrane is more negative than the outside, the cell is going to be inactive. Right now, no impulse is being transmitted along a neuron. Let's talk about this again carefully, just so we have it down pat. If we look at the inside of the cell membrane of an axon, the neuron, we would see there's a little bit of negativity there. In fact, the negativity is going to be around minus 70 millivolts. Also, there's going to be more potassium inside and more sodium outside. Uh, the membrane is relatively impermeable to both ions at this time. This is at the resting state. There is no impulse being sent along the axon right now. Now there is a stimulus to the neuron. Perhaps it's a touch sensing neuron and it has feels pressure on it. This is going to stimulate the neuron. This is going to change the permeability in this little area of the cell membrane. Sodium ions are going to spill into the cell. They, has, they have a positive charge and they carry that positive charge with them. In that little area, the charge is going to go up to plus 30 millivolts. So now on the inside of the cell membrane, the charge is plus 30. When the cell membrane starts to become positive on the inside, it's called local depolarization. Depolarization. No negativity left, because polarization means negative. So depolarization, no negativity. Inside the cell membrane, we've gotten a little tiny bit positive. It's called graded potential. But if the stimulus is strong enough and enough sodium comes in, then this local depolarization is going to trigger an action potential or a nerve impulse. Then that nerve impulse is going to travel all the way down the axon. It's called an all or nothing principle. Once it starts to travel along this way, it's going to carry on to the very bottom of the axon, which is called the axon terminal, and it's going to cause, for example, a skeletal muscle to contract. If enough sodium comes into the cell membrane, remember we're going to start to have a positive charge, and if we reach that plus 30 millivolts, that's going to be enough for an action potential to be initiated. If you've ever gone to a hockey game or another big event and participated in the wave, then that's kind of what we're looking at here. So what happens is we have this term called propagation of action potential, which sounds very fancy, but it just means a passing along of this charge. So depolarization of the first membrane patch or area causes changes in the permeability of the adjacent membrane, the membrane right beside it and it causes those same events to happen again, or depolarization. So much like the wave at a hockey game, all parts of this axon are gonna take a turn becoming positive. And the idea of the all or nothing response means that the nerve impulse either is propagated completely or it is not. What has happened so far is that sodium has flown, pardon me, traveled into the cell membrane and with it, it brought a positive charge. And it changed the charge in the inside of the cell membrane to plus 30 millivolts. Well now we're going to have repolarization. Re means again, polar means negative. So we're going to make it negative again. How do we do that? Potassium ions are allowed to diffuse out of the cell because the permeability of the cell membrane changes and it allows potassium now to leave. Well, potassium had a positive charge and it carried it with it. So now we're back to a negative charge again, around minus 70 millivolts.
Now, it's time to reset the neuron and put all of the sodium and potassium back into their original spots so that this event can happen again. So how does that happen? It's using the sodium-potassium pump, which is kind of a actually really important thing in general anatomy and physiology. It's one of those core principles. Uh, the sodium-potassium pump uses ATP, so it uses energy. It's an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions are ejected out of the cell for every two potassium ions that are put back into the cell. We're trying to recreate that gradient where there should be lots of potassium inside the cell and lots of sodium outside the cell. Um, until this is complete, the neuron cannot conduct another nerve impulse. Focus on the sodium potassium pump here. This is an amazing image. What we see is that it's a protein uh, that's across the plasma membrane, the cell membrane. And remember that some of these protons can act like doors. And in this case, it's going to use ATP and it's going to pump three sodiums outside and try to really create a lot of sodium outside the cell membrane, pump two potassiums into the cell membrane, and that's going to create lots of potassium inside the cell membrane. And remember, this is just the ratio, three to two. So in fact, it pumps lots of these ions. So what happens when this nerve impulse reaches the axon terminal, the end of the neuron? Well, calcium channels open and calcium spills into the end of the neuron. This calcium causes vesicles to release neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. It's termed exocytosis. The neurotransmitter diffuses neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors on the other side. Uh, this could be the next neuron or at a muscle, for example. If enough neurotransmitter is released, a graded potential will be generated and eventually an action potential, which is a nerve impulse in the following neuron, or it could be an action potential in a muscle cell, leading it to contracting. The electrical changes caused by the neurotransmitter are very brief because that neurotransmitter is going to get either broken down by something called acetylcholinesterase or another type of enzyme or taken back up again into the neuron. Overall, this transmission of an impulse is called electrochemical because it involves an electrical impulse and a chemical change. Okay, look at this. We see in the upper portion of this image, this is a neuron coming down and the end of a neuron. An action potential is coming down. When the action potential arrives at the end of the neuron, calcium floods inside. The calcium causes the vesicles to go against the outer edge and release their contents, which might be um, acetylcholine, for example, some type of neurotransmitter. It's going to be a chemical messenger. This chemical messenger travels across the synaptic cleft, which is basically a gap, and goes across to another neuron or to a muscle or to a gland, and there are receptors over there that are able to pick up this chemical signal. So they pick up the neurotransmitter and it creates a change. Um, we could think of this as a lock and key, for example. So in your house, you have a lock and it accepts certain keys and that can cause a change to happen, which is unlocking your door. Same kind of idea here. The neurotransmitter is like a key and the purple uh, images on the bottom are like a lock and they're very specialized. Um, the key only fits in certain locks. This is what the pharmaceutical industry is mostly built on. Many drugs are made which mimic these chemical transmitters, the neurotransmitters, so that they can float along through the body and have an impact on the receptors. Or a pharmaceutical company may make kind of like a, a key that would get broken off into a lock. It's a looks like a neurotransmitter, it goes and sits inside the receptor, but it has no impact. It just blocks it, as if you put a key in your lock and broke the key off, and nobody was ever able to put a key in there. So, it's kind of interesting, because it's a lot about how drugs are designed. When the neurotransmitter is received, um, ion channels open, and those ion channels are sodium channels, actually, and when the sodium influxes into the receiving neuron or the muscle cell, it causes a chain reaction in that muscle cell or receiving neuron.
Our brains are constantly processing information, which requires communication between billions of nerve cells. Signals are passed from a sending neuron to a receiving neuron at a junction called a synapse. An action potential in the sending neuron travels down the axon until it reaches a synaptic terminal. The narrow gap between the synaptic terminal and the receiving neuron is called the synaptic cleft. The synaptic terminal of a sending neuron contains numerous vesicles filled with neurotransmitters, chemicals that carry information across the synaptic cleft. When an action potential reaches the synaptic terminal, the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane of the sending neuron, releasing neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters affect the receiving neuron, changing the distribution of charge across its membrane. Let's take a closer look. An action potential is propagated down an axon by the opening and closing of sodium and potassium channels. When an action potential arrives at the synaptic terminal, it causes the opening of calcium channels, shown in green. Calcium ions enter the synaptic terminal through the calcium channels. Calcium ions bind to the vesicles containing neurotransmitters. This causes the vesicles to fuse with the plasma membrane of the sending neuron, releasing neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors in the plasma membrane of the receiving neuron. Here, the receptors are ion channels that open. Ions move across the membrane, changing the distribution of charge across the membrane. The neurotransmitters are quickly removed from the synaptic cleft, ending their effect on the receiving neuron. A single neuron can receive signals from many sending neurons. The signals arriving from the axon on the left are excitatory. They make the receiving neuron more likely to generate an action potential, as indicated by the green glows. Signals from the axon on the right are inhibitory. They make the receiving neuron less likely to generate an action potential, as indicated by the red glows. The two sets of signals cancel each other out, and no action potential is generated. Now, only excitatory signals are transmitted and the receiving neuron generates an action potential down its axon. The signals that pass between these and countless other neurons constitute our thoughts and coordinate our activities. This video is one of the most valuable um, ways to portray this information in the entire PowerPoint. I urge you to watch it several times make your own notes and try to really comprehend what's happening here at the synaptic at the sign on to something a little bit new we're going to talk about reflexes if you've ever gone to your doctor's office and the doctor has tapped just below your knee to see your reaction that would be assessing some of your reflexes also i've seen it many times in icu when a neuro a neurologist or a neurosurgeon comes in and does a really good neurological assessment of a patient um, what they may do, for example, is shine a light in the patient's eye and observe for pupillary constriction, or they may inject co ice cold water into the patient's ear and observe their reactions. So, in order to understand those processes, we need to understand a little bit about reflexes. So, I think we know that reflexes are very fast and very repetitive, predictable, and they're involuntary. We don't have to think about them. There are somatic reflexes and autonomic reflexes. Somatic are to do with our skeletal muscles, and that would be like the example in the doctor's office um, of having just below your knee tap. That's the patellar reflex. Another example would be if we put our hand on a hot stove, which would be silly, we would immediately jerk our hand away based on a somatic reflex. The autonomic reflexes have to do with the muscles around your blood vessels and have to do with the heart and your glands. A good example of that is the carotid artery um, having pressure sensors in it. If those pressure sensors just detect a high blood pressure,
then there will be an autonomic reflex of lowering blood pressure by reducing heart rate. The brain reminds me of a mushroom. On a mushroom, you have the mushroom cap, and then inside you have a stem. And so we'll see that it looks a lot like that. So if we took off the top of the mushroom, it would be the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum. The cerebral hemispheres are divided into two, and the cerebellum is one, it's at the very back. And then inside the mushroom, we would have the stem, and at the very top of that, we would have this purple area called the diencephalon. And then below that, we would have the brain stem. I've had lots of patients that have had brain surgery or they've had brain injury. And one of our most concerning things is when the brain stem is affected. When the brain stem becomes affected, it's very concerning because it controls the vital signs of the body. So if it's compressed or if it's damaged during surgery, there can be um, very dire consequences because the vital signs can't be sustained normally. So let's take a look at these brain parts. We know that the cerebral hemispheres are paired. There's two of them, the left and the right. Um, they have most of the brain mass and they have these bumps and valleys. <clears throat> They're calling them ridges and grooves here. So the ridges or bumps are called gyri and the grooves or valleys um, are called sulci. When you have a really deep valley, it's called a fissure. The lobes of the cerebral hemispheres are named after the cranial bones that are above them. So that makes it a little easier to remember them. And if we were to like really study this um, cerebral hemispheres, we would notice that the cortex or the outside lining of the brain, uh, there's a layer of gray matter. And then inside that is white matter. But within the white matter, there are little sort of pockets of gray matter, and they're involved with information that's sent to skeletal muscles. So there are two cerebral hemispheres. Together they're called the cerebrum. They're divided by a deep fissure called the longitudinal fissure. So there's actually a division between these two cerebral hemispheres. But the way that they communicate with each other is through some nerve fibers. They're collectively called the corpus callosum, which to me sounds like some kind of blizzard at Dairy Queen. But anyway, that's the term corpus callosum. So that allows communication between the left and right hemisphere. Also interesting to note that if a patient suffers a stroke, which is basically some death of uh, nervous tissue in the brain, um, if they suffer a stroke on the right-hand side of the brain, it may have more of an impact on the left-hand side of the body and vice versa. Okay, looking in a little bit more detail here, uh, we have the cerebral hemispheres shown. Um, we have the frontal lobe, and remember, these sections are named based on the bones that they are underneath. So let's remember the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. Okay, below that we have the cerebellum, and remember inside our mushroom cap uh, we have the, the stem, which is the brain stem. The brain stem is made up of a couple of components including the pons and medulla, and then we have the spinal cord going downwards. Uh, we don't need to memorize these, the names of the sulcus, the sulci, I guess is plural, uh, but just notice that the um, fissures are deeper than a sulcus and the gyri are the mounds. These next two slides give a really good overview of um, what the brain does. It takes quite a bit of studying to get these down pat, so I encourage you to really spend some time on these. Um, so it starts off talking about the cerebral hemispheres, we know there are two parts, and that the outer layer is gray, so we call that gray matter. And it lists here some of the jobs that it does, including uh, dealing with emotions, and some of our skeletal muscle activity. There are basal nuclei, they're also involved with skeletal muscle movements. Remember, they're little pockets of gray matter within the cerebral hemispheres. Inside, in the very kind of middle area inside of our skull, we have the diencephalon. It's divided into three parts. We've got the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and we've got actually an epithalamus. It's listed a little later in our notes. And um, there's a little system within that called the limbic system. 
The thalamus really is a relay center, so it really relays impulses up and downwards. It's also involved in memory, so the thalamus is about memorizing. Hypo means below, so hypothalamus, a little bit below this. It really integrates the um, nervous system with the endocrine system. So it has to do with regulation of hormones, but it takes in information from the nervous system. So this is really a linkage place. The hypothalamus is a linkage place between the nervous system and the endocrine system. It regulates other things like body temperature, how much we eat, uh, water balance, and thirst. So if you're feeling really thirsty, you can blame your hypothalamus on that. Okay, the limbic system is kind of within this area and it is involved with our emotions and our memory. Now, don't worry about the brainstem, pons, medulla, and reticular formations here because they come up later in the slides and we can focus on it there. But let's talk about the cerum, cerebellum. Pardon me. The cerebellum is about balance and muscle movement. So if you're following a big athlete, like right now Sidney Crosby would still be pretty popular, um, he must have a very well advanced cerebellum because he is professional at maintaining balance and posture and having excellent skeletal muscle movement. So cerebellum is at the very, very back of your skull and it very posterior, pardon me, of your skull. And this is all about balance. The only thing I want to emphasize out of this slide is that Broca's area is involved with speech. So if you hear that term Broca's area, that's involved with speech. Um, you don't have to memorize all of the locations of these things. I think just an appreciation that different parts of our brain are responsible for different functions. So if you have a patient that has a damaged cerebellum in a certain area and they're having difficulty with their vision, it helps you understand, you can understand why that is. Okay, now we're chatting about the diencephalon. So if we took a mushroom apart, remember if we take the cap off the mushroom, the diencephalon would be on the very top of the stem. And so this diencephalon sits on top of the brain stem, made of three structures, I already started to talk about them a bit, the thalamus, and then hypothalamus is below that, and then the epithalamus. So the thalamus is a part of the diencephalon. It is a relay center. It sends impulses to the correct part of the cortex. Um, so it just, it's kind of like a UPS mail delivery person. It's just relaying information back and forth. Hypothalamus, of course, is below the thalamus. And um, we know that the hypothalamus integrates the nervous system with the endocrine system. Uh, this helps regulate your body temperature, your thirst, your metabolism. Uh, this has involvement in your, in your emotions and very importantly, and this is covered more in the endocrine system, but it regulates what the pituitary gland does, kind of like the boss of the pituitary gland. The epithalamus is part of the diencephalon as well. It has the pineal body, which is an endocrine gland that releases melatonin, has to do with your sleep-wake cycle, of course, and it also has something called the choroid plexus that produces cerebrospinal fluid. So a couple important jobs there in the epithalamus. Remember that the brain stem is a crucial part of the brain that controls vital signs. So above all, if you remember that, um, it helps a lot clinically. Um, occasionally a very sad thing happens with our patients when they develop really high intracranial pressures. I've seen this lots of times. The patient gets high intracranial pressures and it pushes downward pressure on the brain. This pressure has the tendency to squeeze the um, brainstem down into the opening of the spinal, of the vertebrae, I guess I should say, and it functionally squeezes the brainstem. When the brainstem is squeezed, it can't act properly, it can't work properly, and the vital signs become irregular. So maybe that'll help you remember the key point that your vital signs are controlled in your brainstem. But let's talk a bit more specifically. We've got the midbrain, pons, and medulla. The midbrain has some nerve fiber tracts moving upwards and downwards, and it has some visual and auditory reflexes. The pons is next. Very important. It includes some areas that control breathing. You'll study that more in uh, respiratory anatomy and physiology. Of course, it has lots of uh, fiber tracts. And the medulla oblongata is the lowest part of the brainstem. 
And there it is, controlling heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, swallowing, and vomiting. Brainstem, there's also um, a portion of the brainstem called the reticular formation. It's kind of diffuse in the brainstem, but it all works together. And it's involved with your sleep-wake cycles and consciousness. That's very important. Very important if our patients are conscious or unconscious. And it's this area of the brain that really plays a big role in that. Also, thank goodness, it filters incoming sensory information. We should be very grateful for our reticular formation because we don't want our brain to be overwhelmed by all the data that comes to it. It needs to be a bit filtered out. And remember, it's your reticular formation is a filter for all that incoming info. Because our brain and spinal cord are so essential to life, they have a lot of protection systems. We've got the meninges, the CSF, and the blood-brain barrier. If you've ever heard of meningitis, it's an infection pardon me, of the meninges, the layers of the brain, and it can be life-threatening. There's uh, bacterial meningitis and viral meningitis. We look at the central nervous system, and we study from the outside inwards, these meninges. The outermost layer is called the dura mater, which means tough mother. Um, it actually is a double layer, but that's rarely talked about, to be honest. We usually just refer to it as the dura mater. But technically, there's a periosteum, and it's attached to the bone, so the inside of the skull. And then the meningeal layer, which is the outer covering of the brain. So we've got our dura mater. Next, we have the arachnoid layer. It's named like after a spider, because arachnoid means spider. And it's because this layer has little webs kind of going inwards. So it mentions here, web-like extensions into the subarachnoid, so below arachnoid space, which attach it to the next layer, the pia mater. <clears throat> the subarachnoid space is full of CFS, <laughs> pardon me, cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. And there are these projections called arachnoid granulations. They're just projections, just fancy word. Um, which protrude through the dura mater, and their job is to absorb cerebral spinal fluid into blood. Okay, so the next layer, the innermost layer, this is another protective layer of the central nervous system, is called pia mater, and it is uh, it means soft mother if you translate it. It clings to the surface of the brain and the spinal cord. It's the innermost protective layer. It is one of the meninges as well. Here we see those protective layers of the brain. What an amazing design. Of course, we have our skin that's ultra sensitive to pain if we bump our head. We've got our periosteum, the outer layer of the bone, and then bone of the skull. Very strong structure. And then we've got a dura mater, tough mother, that's what that means, and it's one of our meninges made up of two parts that are listed there. Then we have our next meninge called the arachnoid mater, has little spider webby looking projections in the subarachnoid space, which is full of cerebral spinal fluid. Here also we see these fancy little bump outs, the arachnoid granulations, they're just bump outs where the CSF can be absorbed. Um, next we have the pia mater, the soft mother, this is the innermost meninge. So look at this complex system we have to protect our brain and spinal cord. Having CSF uh, floating around our brain and spinal cord is a great design. The, whole, the overall idea is to um, cushion blows, so if you hit your head it will absorb some of that energy. So if we look at it, it's very similar to uh, plasma, if we were to study it. Um, it's produced by the choroid plexus, which are some capillaries in the ventricles of the brain. So choroid plexus produce CSF. It provides watery cushioning. Um, it circulates. Uh, ependymal cells have little cilia on them and they circulate this through these spaces like the arachnoid space, the ventricles of the brain, and the central canal of the spinal cord. The CFSF is then absorbed in the dural venous sinuses, specifically called arachnoid villi. There are four ventricles in the brain. The ventricles should be symmetrical and midline. The two uppermost ventricles are the lateral ventricles. There is a third ventricle below them, and then a fourth ventricle below that, and the fourth ventricle opens into the central canal, which is inside the spinal cord. So these ventricles have cerebral spinal fluid in them, and they're shown in blue here. If there is an injury to the head, um, what can happen is there can be a bleed inside the cranium, or there can be swelling inside a part of the brain, and there can be a shifting of these ventricles so they are no longer midline.
this would be a, a poor finding on a CAT scan. Here we see again that there are two lateral ventricles, a third ventricle, and a fourth ventricle. Also, there's a central canal in the spinal cord. All of these contain CSF, and there would also be CSF floating around this entire space in the subarachnoid space. Great overview of the production, flow, and absorption of cerebral spinal fluid. Number one, CSF is produced in the choroid plexus of each ventricle, kind of like a little network of capillaries. Number two, CSF flows through the ventricles, the subarachnoid space, um, and through the central canal of the spinal cord. Those are the highlights of that. Number three, CSF flows through the subarachnoid space. And number four, CSF is absorbed in the arachnoid granulations. We've already learned a bit about the blood-brain barrier, um, but this is a really good review. The least permeable capillaries of the body. Isn't that fantastic? We want to protect the brain and spinal cord from dangerous things. So it's very good that these aren't very permeability. Permeable, pardon me. There's a list of some things that can go across and a list of some things that can't go across. When we think about our spinal cord, we often think our spinal cord extends all the way down to our tailbone, um, or cox coccyx. But actually, it ends. So it starts at the foramen magnum, which is the big opening at the base of the skull. And it ends really high at first, the first lumbar vertebrae or the second lumbar vertebrae. That's really high in your back that it ends. From there down, there are spinal nerves. Some people will say that it looks like a horse's tail, and this cauda equina uh, translates to horse's tail. So a horse's tail has a really uh, meaty area of it and then at the end it's all just hairs. So it's very interesting that the spinal cord has similar structure. It's two-way pathway to and from the brain and 31 pairs of spinal nerves arise from the spinal cord. The spinal nerves have different names. Obviously they're named after where they branch off from the uh, spinal cord. So we've got cervical spinal nerves, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. If we study the spinal cord, we see that there is gray and white matter. It's shown in the next diagram. Uh, the gray matter is mostly cell bodies, and the white matter is mostly the myelinated axons of neurons. Remember, myelin, myelination is produced by fatty white substances, and it makes this look white. Um, sensory afferent tracts obviously go up to the brain and efferent tracts go away from the brain. You can see some of the anatomy of the spinal cord and there it is, the gray matter and the white matter. A central canal is in the middle. We also see pairs of spinal nerves emerging from the spinal cord. They would have afferent and efferent pathways. Uh, we see the pia matter, the arachnoid matter, and the dura matter, the three meninges, which are protective of the central nervous system. Those are the important points on this slide. Just like any other structures we've looked at, there, are, there is a series of connective tissue associated with uh, the nervous system. So when we look at a nerve, it's actually bundles of neurons um, outside of the central nervous system. It has lots of layers of connective tissue. They're called endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium. We'll look at them now. So, at the smallest level, we see the axon of a neuron. It's wrapped by a myelin sheath. That is wrapped by connective tissue called endoneurium. Those are bundled all together into fascicles, and that is wrapped by perineurium. Then those fascicles are bundled together along with some blood, ve blood vessels, pardon me, and then all of that together gets bundled and wrapped with epineurium, the outermost layer of connective tissue. Uh, mixed nerves have both sensory and uh, motor fibers. Sensory is afferent, motor is efferent. And as it mentions, it carries impulses to and from the CNS. Such a fantastic slide. Let's start at the top. The somatic nervous system. This is what we typically think of when we um, do a bicep curl. Okay, so in our central nervous system, we have a neuron cell body, and then extending out into the peripheral nervous system, we have the axon of the neuron. I see that it's, it's uh, myelinated, and it has the nodes of Ranvier. When we get to the end of the neuron, it can excrete a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which can then affect a skeletal muscle. Okay, next section, autonomic nervous system, divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. 
parasympathetic is easiest, so let's do that first. This is going to involve two neurons. The first one's myelinated, and the second one's not myelinated. The first one starts in the CNS, just like usual, and there goes an axon body with the blue bumps on it. So that is myelinated. When it gets to a ganglion, that's where two neurons meet. Um, acetylcholine can be released as the neurotransmitter. When that's released, the second neuron gets triggered. It's unmyelinated. It's going to go along and end at something like cardiac muscle or some glands, and it will release acetylcholine in order to to be a chemical messenger in this system. Remember, parasympathetic is all about relaxation. Sympathetic is about being hyper. Two parts of this system. The, we'll talk about the first one. There are two neurons involved. The first neuron, its cell body is in the central nervous system. It's myelinated and it's short. It's a short little neuron. It releases acetylcholine at its synaptic cleft. The second neuron, can be triggered by the acetylcholine and it is unmyelinated. When it reaches its destination, like the glands, um, the heart, the stomach, it releases norepinephrine as its neurotransmitter. Okay, the second section here of the sympathetic division of the nervous system. We've got a neurotransmitter again and the cell body begins in the CNS, but this one ends in the adrenal medulla. So in the adrenal gland, the very middle part, it tells the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine and norepinephrine, and they have an impact on things like blood vessels and cardiac muscle, and um, this tends to speed up the heart, for example, and constrict blood vessels. This is an amazing slide. I encourage you to spend a great deal of time uh, making notes about this slide and listening to my overview and reviewing the slide. It's a great image. Okay, let's add a little more. Let's talk a bit more about the parasympathetic nervous system. For example, the preganglionic fiber is a little bit longer. We know that acetylcholine is released from the end of it. And this uh, receptor is called a nicotinic receptor. It is the beginning of the postganglionic fiber. That postganglionic fiber or neuron releases acetylcholine and the site which responds to that is called a muscarinic receptor. Now let's talk about the sympathetic nervous system. The preganglionic fiber or neuron is shorter. It releases acetylcholine and that lands in a receptor that's considered to be a nicotinic receptor. Um, now the postganglionic fiber or neuron is going to release norepinephrine and that is going to affect either an alpha or a beta receptor. Alpha receptors are mainly in the vasculature. Beta receptors are beta one receptors, pardon me, are in the heart, and beta two receptors are mainly in the lungs. Um, also, I want to mention that um, nicotinic and muscarinic receptors are also called cholinergic receptors. There are different types of receptors found throughout the body that will respond to different neurotransmitters, like the lock and key idea. Uh, receptors that are predominantly found in the heart are called beta-1. So beta-1 receptors are mostly found in the heart. Beta-2 receptors are mostly found in the lungs, especially uh, we talk about around the airways. So they cause bronchoconstriction or bronchodilation. Alpha receptors are predominantly found in the vasculature. So if we have um, stimulation of alpha receptors, then we're going to have constriction of blood vessels or vasoconstriction. This is how we often categorize drugs. We may call a drug a beta-1 sympathomimetic. That means we know that beta-1 is predominantly in the heart. Sympath sympathetic nervous system speeds everything up. And if we're mimicking it, sympathomimetic, then we know it's going to increase heart rate. A beta-2 parasympatholytic, um, well, we know that beta-2 is predominantly in the lungs. Uh, parasympathetic system would make you relax and make your airways kind of close a little bit but if we want to be a lytic or lysit like a parasympatholytic we're going to block that effect so it actually cause bronchodilation so learning these receptor names helps us have this whole classification system of drugs so we can keep track of what the drug effects are and I guess I should elaborate on that and say that many times we give drugs that mimic the sympathetic system or mimic the parasympathetic system or lyse these systems so they have an effect at these receptors.
On the left, we have an overview of the parasympathetic system. Remember, the system is all about relaxation. So some people will use an acronym called SLUG or SLUD. Okay, SLUG, salivation, lacrimation, urination, and gastrointestinal um, activity. You could also use the acronym SLUD, salivation, lacrimation, urination, and defecation. Those are the things that um, tend to be parasympathetic effects. Um, also, we can see that in dark blue, a neuron starts in the CNS, travels out to a ganglia where um, neurons meet, and then it affects another neuron which goes to the part of the body that's impacted. On the right, we have the sympathetic system in green. This is all about fighting off t a tiger or let's say somebody's mugging you and you're really scared. Well, you need to be able to run fast and, and save your life. So we call this the fight or flight response. This system's a little bit different. It's also known as the thoracolumbar division because the neurons arise from that part of the spinal cord. They then link up with a second neuron in a ganglia and then they go out to the body system in which they affect. So the sympathetic nervous system is known as fight or flight. Um, it um, comes into effect when we're very stressed or threatened. It increases a lot of activities like our ability to run, for example. Um, this is a new acronym to me, this E division. It allows exercise, excitement, dealing with emergencies or embarrassment. When these types of emotions are experienced or these activities, then we call it the fight or flight division is activated. Parasympathetic is all about relaxing. Remember the slug or the slud? And they use the D acronyms here. Digestion, defecation, diuresis. This is all about relaxing and watching Netflix. We're conserving our energy. Um, body or organs are served by both divisions, except they're listed here. Blood vessels, structures of the skin, some of the glands and the adrenal medulla, which are only impacted by the sympathetic nervous system. And here are all the impacts of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. I'm not going to read them out. It's important that you know these.